Well, to begin with, I just think it's great to be able to talk with you. Thank you. It's such and, a pleasure. You know, I know that you had a wonderful trip to Jewish Latin America. Something that I always wonder is, why do we call that area Latin America? Yeah. Well, I'll start by, by thanking you uh, for this conversation and for and saluting you for the wonderful series that you have put together over, I don't know, many years. Um, I have been, I guess, never being able to fully leave behind Latin America. I was born and raised mm -hmm. in Mexico, the child of a, already Mexican-born parents who were themselves children of immigrants uh, from Eastern Europe, from Poland and uh, Ukraine and Lithuania. Um, and Latin America, after I left that uh, region of the world and moved to the United States, uh, particularly to New England in uh, Amherst, Massachusetts, has always been a magnet for me. I, I feel enormous debt for the, in, for that region. I, I, as a Mexican mm -hmm. Jew, I feel I am at the crossroads. And because of the sum of languages, I feel that I am a bridge that uh, writes for different audiences, depending on the different languages, in that uh, as a bridge creates connections, uh, communicating vessels mm -hmm. from different parts. Latin America is a fascinating region of the world. And when it comes to Jewish culture is a unique one because of the successive ways, waves of immigrants and newcomers and settlers and conquistadors and people running away, escaping, or, or the, all the ideologies that have come in from that area. But probably the most important debate is that we Latin Americans are always saying that the North Americans who call themselves Americans, I mean, this is not the United States, but America, mm -hmm. have stolen or kidnapped the name, and that the name America, how, however contested it is, it really belongs to everybody. But, you know, names are always in the middle of a fight, one way or another. <laughs> yes. yes, you're right. You were mentioning that there were a lot of migrations and different kinds of migrations to Latin America, and one of the fascinating things that you did was writing a book, which I have right here, The Seventh Heaven by Ilan, and travels through uh, Jewish Latin America. It is interesting that you did that here in the 21st century, and we know that sort of like the first traveler to Asia and to North Africa and to some of those places was a Spanish Jewish man, Benjamin de Tudela. Benjamin de Tudela yeah. Yeah, who wrote all his travels in Hebrew. Yeah. And then, of course, they were translated later on. And, you know, in the 20th century, in Poland and, you know, in the Pale of Settlement, asking, yeah. you know did it, and you did it in Latin America, you yeah. know, for Jews, you know, encountering different communities, and through writers, you were sort of like catching on some of the really interesting nuances, mm -hmm. not only of the Jewish communities, but of the countries themselves towards the Jews. I would like to hear some of that, yeah. you know, so, some, so, some comparisons. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm really thrilled because um, during the trip, Gloria, I did feel myself an integral part of that tradition of Jewish travelers to different parts of the world. You know, by definition, we Jews are time travelers yeah. and land sure. travelers. Sure. We are always 
uh, going from one diaspora to another. We are telling each other that next year we will be in Jerusalem, <laughs> or if you're a Sephardic you, Jew, that it will be next year in, mm -hmm. in Spain, uh, the original source of it, or for whatever it is, meaning we are always somewhere else and always looking from the outside in, these outsiders that have a particular perspective. And I think throughout Jewish history, that outside, outsiderness has both turned us into a target, they, they don't fully belong. And so in, it can allow us to see different things from a outside, mm -hmm. a, from a, a, a perspective that is not integral or native. So I, in general, I have always thought of myself as a traveler. And here I wanted to do something as if Benjamin de Tudela mm -hmm. had been living in the 21st century. Yes. Or if Anski, yes. that you mentioned, yes. was old, who traveled through the Pale of Settlement mm -hmm. uh, shortly after the, second, the First World War mm -hmm. and wanted to see what that context was all about. What is Latin America today uh, in tr from the perspective of the, of, of the uh, Jews? Mm -hmm. And how are the different communities in different uh, countries uh, communicating with each other or isolated from one another? Roughly speaking, as you know, there are about a half a million Jews in Latin America. The largest concentration is in Argentina, mm -hmm. around 250,000 Jews, predominantly in cities like Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. the capital, and La Plata. Um, but you know, the, the Argentine Jews started in agricultural colonies mm -hmm. that were sport, sponsored by uh, French philanthropic organizations, by the Mar Baron Maurice de Hirsch, mm -hmm. who was hoping to encourage immigration from the shtetls, the shtetlach in Eastern Europe to uh, Latin America where he thought a new promised land could, would be built one day. So he was kind of advancing the dream of a utopia for the Jews. Then comes Brazil with roughly between 160 to 180,000. Mexico comes third and then there's Colombia, Peru, Colombia other mm -hmm. that, are, that are considerably smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, what I wanted to do is wanted to see how this, each of these communities functions as a unit, mm -hmm. um, what the metabolism, what the DNA in that community uh, is. Uh, so I would uh, visit uh, uh, Shabbat services, or if it was Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah, uh, or I would travel through different locations where the Jews had uh, settled before and were eventually they moved to the big city, as in the case of Argentina or in the case of Mexico. Uh, I came here all the way to Santa Fe, Arizona, Colorado, to see where the crypto Jews, the conversos, had escaped during the time of the, of the colonial period, and uh, did the same thing in the Caribbean. And all in, a, in the context of trying to create a narrative mm -hmm. of travel, the travel writer as an observer, as a, as a kind of a narrator that can tell you historical facts but can also question them, that, that can enter the history and ask probing questions to the locals and then kind of subvert them and see them from a different perspective. I am, I, I've been a teacher for many, many years and an academic, a professor, mm -hmm. and I think that academia can be a place for cowards, <laughs> uh, where it's easy to be a lazy thinker, mm -hmm. uh, not to think mm -hmm. uh, thoroughly or committedly, and to uh, escape through theories and mm -hmm. ca concepts and ca categories. What I wanted to do, Maria, is to travel not only th with my two feet, and my body, I wanted to travel with my mind mm -hmm. as well. And everywhere I went, when I went to Peru, when I went to Mexico, I wanted to read everything that had been written by Jews, about Jews in each of these countries, and infuse myself in that information. And then be able to see how much the people locally interacted with that history. Uh, one thing that I found that is absolutely I would say stunning, but I don't think you will be surprised, is that Latin American Jews know less about each other's, uh, yes. like the Colombian yes. community, about the Mexican community, yes. or the mm -hmm. Peruvian, or the Argentine, or the Puerto Rican, than we outsiders in the United States or in Europe can 
uh, uh, find out, we tend to see that region as a globality, whereas Mexican Jews think of themselves as Mexican Jews, but not in any way connected with the Peruvian Jews or the Colombian Jews. And it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating, it's troublesome, it's, uh, it's peculiar. Uh, so in many ways, I think that when I ended up with uh, the seventh heaven th travels through Jewish Latin America, I was creating um, a spider web yes. of connections that the, uh, the natives would not necessarily see. Yes, you're right. And that's one of the things that happened to me when I read the book. Mm -hmm. I was sort of like traveling with you and also at the same time reading your feelings. Mm -hmm. Reading your feelings about being in the places and also having experienced the writings of the writers right. from the area. Yeah. And something that called my attention even though he's not Jewish, is that you said that you were guided in Buenos Aires, in Jewish Buenos Aires, yeah. by Borges. Absolutely, yes. Tell me about that. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> let me first, before I respond to that question, I want to yes. respond to an aspect that you just mentioned, yes. which is the, the emotions that you were feeling in the yes. book. Um, one of the things that to me is more revealing in the comparison between North American Jews, but in particular a United States Jews mm -hmm. and Latin American Jews, mm -hmm. is the emotional world in which they live. Yes. Latin American Jews, just like Latin America, mm -hmm. exist in a raw universe of emotions. We express our emotions mm -hmm. much more. We can be more <laughs> warm, we could be colder, we can be angrier, but yes. it's the, they are more extreme. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think it's a surprise that we have mm -hmm. created the entire industry of telenovelas, where everybody's exactly. crying all yes. the time yes. or, or uh, uh -huh. exhilarated all the yeah. time. Uh -huh. um, it is a roller coaster of emotions, and I think Latin American Jews, as good... Um, uh, imitators of the environment mm -hmm. have become much more emotional than American Jews in the United States or, or mm -hmm. United States Jews in the United States. So one of the aspects that I also wanted to explore is in what way the, the emotional life of an Argentine Jewish community different from the emotional life of the Mexican Jewish community or of the Cuban mm -hmm. Jewish community. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was part of the the food for thought and the food for emotions mm -hmm. that I was exploring. But going to Borges, Borges has been, Jorge Luis Borges, the mm -hmm. astonishing Latin American writer specifically from Argentina, yes. born, in, born in 1899, died in 1986, um, was not Jewish, and yet throughout oh. his life he always said he wished he had been and wrote yes. immortal uh, short stories, poems, essays about uh, Jewishness in different ways. Not so much about being a Latin American Jew. Mm -hmm. There's very little of in Borges about uh, the Jews of Buenos Aires or the Jews of the different comunidades mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Pampas, one or two short stories. But he's mainly interested in Spinoza. He's interested in uh, Kafka, a writer that he mm -hmm. adored. Uh, he's interested in the whole legacy of the Bible in, in the Talmud during the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance. And um, he, he saw himself as an a political writer that is not a political writer mm -hmm. and as you know it's very difficult in Latin America to mm -hmm. be apolitical mm -hmm. so he he got criticized mm -hmm. severely for me Borges I, the first time I went to Buenos Aires I went looking for Borges mm -hmm. it was 1986 uh, Gloria and uh, I had saved all my money uh, I needed to go as soon as I could in the moment I arrived I think the next day I went to a newsstand and the headline was Borges dies in Geneva. Uh, yeah. So I had gone to his town, but he had already left a long time ago mm -hmm. and he was, had been very sick and he had died. So I spent two weeks traveling 
Buenos Aires to see the various locations where Borges would walk uh, oh. through the city, the, so the that, places where he had coffee. Yes. And for me, those short stories and poems were the map, the intellectual map when I came back to write the book to see uh, where the Jewish aspect of a city can be connecting it with other writers that would enable me to see the first immigrants during the, 20th, mm -hmm. the, the late 19th century, the, the first part of the 20th century. Argentina has the notoriety of being the place that uh, at the very beginning of the 20th century has had the only pogrom in this continent, the Semana Tragica, the Tragic mm -hmm. Week, in 1919, where a labor unrest eventually uh, resulted in the death of about 85 different uh, Jews and many, many, the destruction of businesses. And at the end of the 20th century, the anti-Semitic terrorist attack yeah, against yeah. the AMIA in 1994. So it kind of bookends the 20th century at the beginning and at the end. And it's not um, it's not an accidental. Argentina has the largest community, as we were saying. Mm -hmm. So when somebody's going to target, there's a lot of anti-Semitism, and when somebody's going to target a, an aspect of that community, Argentina is going to be right, right on top of the list. Now, why do you think that this kind of behavior developed when the the government itself in Argentina? In the at the end of the 19th century, yep. was asking for people to come in to Argentina from yep. Europe, to to populate the country, to produce agriculture, to make it grow, and of course that was one of the ways that brought the Jews there. That brought the Jews, yeah. not only the Jews from the Pale of Settlement, yep. but also they brought. In, in 1860, the Jews from Morocco, from yeah. northern Morocco, from what is what was called Spanish Morocco, or the Spanish-speaking Jews came in, but since they spoke a Spanish that could be understood, yeah. they could really integrate right. much easier in the community. So, so then I wonder, what is it what brought that anti-Semitism? Yeah. What kind of other population developed in the South Cone that produced yeah. this animosity? Wonderful question, uh, Gloria. And I, I, I want to uh, begin by telling you that that is the topic of the current book that I'm writing. It's tentatively called Hispanic anti-Semitism. Uh, it tells the story. I, I believe the argument that the book makes mm -hmm. is that it is a mistake to call anti-Semitism, to use anti-Semitism as the category mm -hmm. to describe Everything. Arab yeah. anti-Semitism, French anti-Semitism, yeah. British, mm -hmm. uh, German. Mm -hmm. Each of this is uh, behaves in a different way, sees things differently. And I think Hispanic anti-Semitism needs to be understood in its own terms, because what happens in that very populated segment of the world, there are 450 million people in Latin America, and then also in Spain, are another 40 million people, needs to take into account the history of the Inquisition, in the 12th century, in the 13th century, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492, the expulsion of the Jews from um, Portugal, the various immigrations that have happened to Latin America. And essentially, I think there are three um, norms that define Hispanic antisemitism. One is the uh, one rooted in the Catholic Church. Uh, mm -hmm. the La Inquisición Española, el Santo Oficio, the Holy mm -hmm. Office of the Inquisition, that mm -hmm. is rooted in the Middle Ages and that is transposed to the New World in 1492. Mm -hmm. When the missionaries mm -hmm. and the conquistadors arrived, m many of those that were coming from uh, Spain at that time were conversos, mm -hmm. and sometimes the conversos could be more vicious 
than the 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 ones that describe themselves as having purity of blood because when you become a member of a new club you want to prove everybody that you are as proud and as committed and as authentic so in some cases some of the priests that were part of the the inquisition in latin america it came from jewish families that had converted two three generations before the second wave has to do with the rise of what is called kind of the international jew at the night at the end of the 19th century mm -hmm. what the henry fourth described mm -hmm. as the jew as a capitalist a, a money lender mm -hmm. that there were there obviously there were roots to that many centuries before but it's the connection with the protocols of the wise of zion it, it is mm -hmm. a non-religious capital-driven form of anti-Semitism. In, in Latin America, that is what drives the, the animosity against Jews when the Moroccan Jews are arriving, when the Eastern European Yiddish-speaking Jews are arriving. And then the third category is the one that is created roughly in 1948, but it starts before, and it's, con it's related to the creation of the State of Israel, and it's the one that equates anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism. It's important to, to remember that um, each, each country in Latin America has its own way of thinking. Uh, the anti-Semitism in Argentina is different also to the anti-Semitism in Mexico that mm -hmm. is connected with mestizaje, with the mestizos, and to the one in the Caribbean. But I think that what happened ultimately in the Semana Tragica, the tragic week that mm -hmm. we were talking about yeah. in 1919, yeah. mm -hmm. is, a, is a collusion of the recent arrival of immigrants that were Yiddish speakers that had been encouraged by the government, mm -hmm. but now a nativist forces were seeing as potentially contaminating the Argentine spirit, something that we're very used to in the United States with the animosity against immigrants coming from mm -hmm. Latin America. And so these riots were uh, an attempt to stop the immigrants from con continuing to arrive in order to mm -hmm. uh, safeguard the sense of la Argentinidad, the, 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 the view of, and they were sponsored indirectly by the government. As time went by, um, Juan Domingo Perón comes to power, the populism uh, embeds all that and adapts it into the government, mm -hmm. uh, in, into the, the ideology that will define Argentina mm -hmm. in dramatic ways. But it is that second category of the Jew as an agent of either capitalism or seen as a socialist that wants to subvert the political. local forms of, a, of, of capitalism. Yeah, political. Political. Yeah, you know, you mentioned in your book of travels, reading about Bolaños the writer. Yeah. And this sort of like Nazi literature. Yeah and you were sort of surprised and trying to find find something about it. Yeah. Tell us. It's, a, it's a, a fascinating chapter in the history of Latin America that unfortunately is not studied enough. Uh, we don't, mm -hmm. we don't uh, delve fully into it. The, during the Second World War, uh, there were forces in Argentina, in Mexico, in Cuba that aligned themselves with fascist Germany and that were, uh, you know, partners of either Hitler exclusively or Hitler and Mussolini in Italy. Um, Borges himself is the target in a number of moments in his career of anti a uh, uh, anti-cosmopolitan views, mm -hmm. and they accuse him of being a philo-Semite, a lover mm -hmm. of the Jews, mm -hmm. uh, and at that time that is a saying, uh, mm. we want to align ourselves <laughs> with Hitler, and uh, the Jews are destroying the, the Argentine character, and Borges defends himself 
in a very convincing and courageous way. But that shows you the kind of environment that existed. It, during the Second World War, there were partnerships with different governments mm -hmm. by Hitler and other um, uh, associates. And immediately after the end of the Second, or the, before the end of the Second World War, but immediately after, as you know, there is something called the Rat the Group. Uh, and that is the number of former sure. Nazis, mm. uh, commanders, SS, mm -hmm. uh, lieutenants that change their names and find in Latin America, Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, Argentina, Chile. Brazil, mm -hmm. Chile, mm -hmm. uh, the safe heaven mm -hmm. uh, in order to escape the Allies and the Nuremberg trials mm -hmm. and the... Uh, you know, accountability after the atrocities mm -hmm. of the Shoah, of the, mm -hmm. of the Holocaust. They are, many of them, sponsored or uh, helped by the Vatican mm -hmm. and the Catholic Church, and in other occasions by different governments like Perón in, in Argentina, mm -hmm. the government of Brazil, the government of Paraguay. Mm -hmm. So Latin America, South America, but the countries that I listed are actually places where between 1945 and 1960, survivors of Holocaust of the Holocaust camps, uh, of the of crematoria, of the uh, partisaners mm -hmm. in different ghettos, arrived to Latin America, and they end up living in the very same neighborhoods than the former Nazis, who now have changed their names and have acquired new, new, new identities. Probably the most famous of all of them is uh, Eichmann, Adolf uh, Eichmann, mm -hmm. who is captured by the Mossad mm -hmm. uh, in 1960. He had changed his name to Ricardo Clement. He had pretended to have become a, an Argentine. Uh, fully, Argentina had been a magnet for a German exiles in general, so the Nazis mm -hmm. just followed that. They loved uh, them. They loved them. <laughs> and there were several communities, sometimes mm -hmm. where, the, where the agricultural mm -hmm. communities for the Jews uh, were, existed, mm -hmm. there were German communities, and they, they, they interacted with each other. So the history of Nazism in Latin America is a, a very delicate one, and a very complex one. It's the it's the drive to the right, to fascism that exists very strongly. It is the connection that several ideological figures have made with Nazism and with Hitler in particular to propose that there will be a fourth Reich that will emerge in Argentina and in Chile. And I explore that in the book. And, uh, and the sense that uh, in some corners of Latin America, the job of Hitler uh, continues, and yet they never really acknowledged that Hitler uh, did not see Latin America as a place of admiration, and that had he had more time and energy, he would have gone there and conquered it and <laughs> made everybody uh, a slave or a subservient. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh... Oh, we come you from know, a pe peculiar part of yeah, the world. Well, you know, Latin America is so complex, so totally different, right. different languages, yeah. people that come from different places in Europe, uh, people that come from Japan, you yeah. know, in, yeah. the, in Brazil. So it's very complex, but it's, it's in the continents of the north, they paint us with a solid brush. Yes. It's sort of like Latin America, whatever that is. Yeah, you know? it's true. He, he, the impression okay. is that Latin America is monolithic, yes. that everybody's Catholic, yeah. that everybody looks the same, when in yes. fact it's, it's, no, it's very far from the truth. Very, it's, a, uh, it's a multicultural landscape with mm -hmm. many ways of seeing race yes. and ethnicity, yes. many religions, many languages, exactly. many national in nationalist uh, pursuits, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes. You know, something that caught my attention and that I didn't know before was what happened in the Dominican Republic yes. with 
what they did with the black people from Haiti and how they accepted the Jews. Yeah. Please. Of course, and I'm again very happy that we are able to have this conversation because there is a very limited knowledge about all this. Oh, and yes. Finding this commonality and empathy oh. is, is uh, reassuring. The Dominican Republic under Trujillo, the mm -hmm. dictator, uh, and as you know, we have a long-standing tradition of dictators that unfortunately comes to the very present with Daniel Ortega in mm -hmm. Nicaragua and mm -hmm. others. Trujillo was a very complex man. He was a, he was a racist. Mm -hmm. He was a... Uh, he had a very clear sense of uh, superiority of the Dominicans. Mm -hmm. The Hispaniola, the mm -hmm. island originally called Hispaniola, is divided in two parts. Mm -hmm. Haiti on the one side and the Dominican Republic mm -hmm. on the other. And just as when you divide the, with the Rio Grande, the United States to the north and Mexico mm -hmm. to the south, and there is this uh, rivalry and then the racism that comes from the north toward the south much, much more than in the opposite direction. The Dominicans feel themselves superior to the Haitians, and Trujillo in particular, um, perpetuated a number of genocidal uh, efforts in order to quiet down rebellions and desires by the Haitians to jump into the, the Dominican side of the island. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, as usual in that period, in you were talking about mm -hmm. how in Argentina in particular, there was this sense that uh, they needed to populate the country mm -hmm. with, at the end of the 19th century, with mm -hmm. people coming from Europe, because in Argentina, uh, they believed that an immigrant from Italy or an immigrant from Ireland or, an, or a Jew would be far better than a gaucho. And the sooner you got rid, rid of the gauchos, <laughs> you eliminated, eliminated them, the faster the country would become more Europeanized mm -hmm. with the help of these immigrants that were coming from the outside. So you can see the, mm -hmm. the, the dehumanizing yeah. uh, ideology that is taking place there. In the Dominican Republic, Trujillo had exactly the same feeling, but 50 years later, or you know, 60 years later, uh, whereas he was pushing down on blackness, la, la negritud, la negritud. Th in, in, in Haiti and in the Dominican Republic, he was opening the doors. He was one of the only ones that opened the doors to uh, refugees and survivors from the Holocaust arriving because, in part, the United States had closed the quotas mm -hmm. and they were putting pressure on different countries of the Caribbean to open the doors because they themselves, Americans, were not mm -hmm. uh, valiant enough to be doing it. Mm -hmm. And so Trujillo allocated a region called Sosua where the Jews could arrive and in some ways recreate their shtetlach in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. So it was... He saw them as agents of capitalism. He wanted the Jews to push the Dominican Republic forward economically, but he didn't want them to live in any city or anywhere. He wanted them to be specifically in this region. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of replica of the Pale of Settlement or another ghetto that you're imagining. Mm -hmm. That part lasted about mm -hmm. maybe 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I still know many children and grandchildren of the Jews that first stayed in Sosua and eventually saw that as a ticket to enter the United States. And the mm -hmm. Sosuan community um, is now mostly a museum. Uh, it's not a living community anymore. Those Jews uh, dispersed predominantly through the United States, in Miami, in New York, in Chicago, it, but the experience that they had had in the Dominican Republic was a fundamental one. And to, to this day, the children and the grandchildren expressed enormous gratitude for Trujillo in spite of his a, you know, militaristic sure. and genocidal mm -hmm. spirit for having up the doors to them. So you can see the two sides of the coin there. Yeah, that was really an eye-opening for me. Yeah. You know, because I didn't know. Yeah. You know. Cuba. Cuba is a case. Yes. Yes. Have you been in Cuba? No, I haven't oh, been in Cuba. Yes, you've no. got to go. Cuba is a case yeah. for, you know, the Jews of Cuba. I was wondering, 
who are the Jews who left, who kept staying in Cuba, yeah. who stayed in Cuba? Yeah. Why did they stay? You wonder. It's Cuba, in the many journeys that I made mm -hmm. in, in, for the seventh heaven, mm -hmm. Cuba, I kept on returning to Cuba, but mm -hmm. sometimes because it was simply practical. I had an interview with somebody and then the next interview it needed to mm -hmm. take place two months later. So I would be able to come back and then mm -hmm. go once again. So I kept on returning to Cuba. Cuba, first, let's, let's uh, position it on the map. Mm -hmm. Cuba has always been a crucial uh, receiving port mm -hmm. or the parting port of in trade from Europe to different parts of Latin America. And it is said that the, fair, the very first uh, refrigerator was, uh, was uh, in, in all of Latin America was in Cuba. The very first television was wow. in Cuba. And that is because simply some of them were arriving from yes. Europe and sure. it was the first place sure. where, where sure. the boats, but, but the, bo the, bo mm -hmm. the boats, the boat routes. But the, the fact is that Cuba is also a kind of melting pot of the black, the Afro, uh, uh, the African slave mm -hmm. that uh, reorganized uh, the entire uh, island and of uh, the Spaniards that came and of the different immigrant groups that have mm -hmm. uh, successively uh, immigrated to the island. There were Jews in Cuba during the colonial period, but mm, in far smaller numbers than there were in Mexico sure. or in Peru or sure. in sure. Colombia. Sure. But at the end of the 19th mm -hmm. century, because of the routes from, mm -hmm. from Europe, uh, Cuba was a place where many Eastern European Yiddish speaking uh, immigrants, Jewish immigrants would settle sometimes for a week or for a month or for a few years and then move on mm -hmm. to the United States. Cuba and Miami are only sure. 90, 90 miles away. And um, there was a very solid Yiddish speaking community in Cuba That's before, incredible. in the first half of the 20th century, mm -hmm. and even before the revolution, there were uh, sure. Jewish writers, Jewish poets, there was a Yiddish speaking newspaper in Cuba that was very important. Uh, you, you would have, uh, stories about Cuba in Warsaw, in the Yiddish press, or in Odessa, in the Yiddish press, or in different in Lithuania, um, the the Jews of Cuba, they were, as as just as everybody else, were dramatically uh, pushed to take an affiliation with the Fidel Castro revolution in 1958 and 59. Many left in 61, mm -hmm. 62, 63, and went to Miami. Mm -hmm. um, it was said that in that period, Cuba, it, the, the vast majority of those that left Cuba were white, were middle class, and many of the Jews were part of that middle class. Mm -hmm. But some stayed because they, they had come from Bundists mm -hmm. and socialists in anarchists and communist yeah. traditions, and then Cuba was now an experiment yeah. that they wanted to be part of. Uh, some of them lasted for a long period of time. So there's still a Jewish community of about 2,000 Jews in Cuba. It's fascinating. Also, Cuba had, Gloria, like Mexico, in some cases, like other countries mm -hmm. too, two sides, the Sephardic, mm -hmm. uh, but Ottoman. Sephardic, yeah. not yeah. the Spanish mm -hmm. Sephardic. No. That is, mm -hmm. the, the Jews, when the Ottoman Empire Fell. came down mm -hmm. at the end of the 19th century and mm -hmm. first decade of the 20th, they went to Peru, they went to Cu Colombia, they went to, they went to Mexico, mm -hmm. and they went to Cuba and Puerto mm -hmm. Rico, and they were in different businesses. Mm -hmm. So the, you would have the Sephardic Jews mm -hmm. and the Ashkenazi Jews. To this day, there's a Sephardic uh, shul, a <laughs> synagogue, and, a, and an Ashkenazi one, and, yeah. and the... Yeah. They don't function fully, but they are kind of mm -hmm. uh, museums of the past, so to speak. Yes. Yeah. And another yeah. aspect that is very yeah. important mm -hmm. that has happened with the revolution is that uh, because of the sharp organization of the American Jewish community that kept on sending medicine yes. and clothes, the Jews in Cuba became an attractive a population 
for the rest of the country. They could disseminate the, you know, the, the antibiotics that were arriving and so on. And there were many people that started converting into Judaism. Oh my goodness. It, it, marriages and other forms. So yeah, the, yeah. The, mm -hmm. the Jewish community in Cuba today is mostly made of converts. People who are, oh. uh, have converted in the last 20, 30, 10 yeah. years. Uh, and it's very ethnically mixed. There mm -hmm. are black Jews, there are mestizo mm -hmm. Jews, mm -hmm. there are uh, white Jews. It's a facet. And there are many, many tourists yeah. that come and see that uh, in the main uh, building mm -hmm. where you can get a history of how the Jewish community in Cuba mm -hmm. has evolved over time. Oh, that's As in the case of other parts yeah. of Latin America, yeah. the, we were talking about dictators. Uh -huh. Pinochet, oh. who was a, Chile, you know, yeah. se me pone la, la piel chinita. Pinochet, who could be the most destructive mm. figures, could be close to the Jewish community. It's, it's hard to recognize yes, it. And, no. and no. Fidel Castro was close to the Jewish community yes. in different periods too. Yes. And he could be very anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian, but had Israeli friends and uh, even work directly with the Mossad, as I explained in yes. the book. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating, you know, the contradictions. Yeah, it is. Something, something that was interesting and that I would like for you to explore here is the, the, groups, the groups that were defending themselves, the Jewish defense oh, yes. groups yes. in Mexico and in Argentina. There were paramilitary groups that were uh, built by the Jewish communities to defend the Jewish communities mm -hmm. of the vulnerability mm -hmm. because, and the premise is very simple, the government, they knew, would not defend them mm -hmm. in, in, in dangerous situations. Yeah. So are you going to simply allow the, the victimizer to come through the door and you're going to say, I'm sorry, yes, please shoot? Or are you going to do something? Mm -hmm. So there is a long history, very solid history, of organizing mm -hmm. a, 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 with weapons paramilitary groups that serve as a kind of a minority police. They are not going to be ideologically subversive against the government, but they might be at the doors of a synagogue or following a rabbi. Mm -hmm. And in many of the trips that I did to Latin America, uh, going to Peru, going to Colombia, going to Mexico, I would, for instance, meet with a rabbi at a particular place. Mm -hmm. And though the rabbi would not tell me, we would be having lunch at a restaurant with the you know, everybody else in a non-Jewish restaurant, I could see that there were two uh, civilians that were sitting in other tables that had more or less arrived when we had arrived. They were pretending to eat the way we were eating and they left with us. They were not calling attention to themselves, but they were guarding the rabbi. Uh, many of the Jews of Latin America after 1994 with a terrorist attack, mm -hmm. have had to, uh, you know, organize. And it's now if you go to a synagogue, everything has is locked. You have to present a passport two, three weeks in advance. They ask you all sorts of security questions. It is not an open place the way it was when I was growing up. And I don't blame them. Honestly, I don't blame mm -hmm. them. A crucial moment in the history of Jewish Latin America is the kidnapping of Eichmann in 1990. It was, most of the world sees it as, a, as an act, as a justified act yes. by the Israeli government to infiltrate Argentina, kidnap this man who had been instrumental in the creation of mm -hmm. the concentration camps, fly him back incognito to Israel where he would stand trial and eventually found guilty and punished. Mm -hmm. But the Argentine government did not like the idea. So th many Argentines thought that the intrusion of the Mossad in Argentina was an attempt against Argentinian sovereign sovereignty. And they there were, there were either state-sponsored or spontaneous attacks against the Jewish community 
in Argentina in retaliation to what had happened by the Israeli government. And a result of that was that for the very first time, as far as I know, but I think the history is still to be written, mm -hmm. uh, in that chapter still, still needs to be written, uh, the Jews of Argentina organized, sometimes with the direct help of the Israeli security mm -hmm. forces, in creating a paramilitary organism, a kind of mm -hmm a minority Force. army yeah. uh -huh. to react to the attacks, the anti-Semitic acts that were coming against the Eichmann uh, controversy. And uh, that began a movement of these armies mm -hmm. of self-defense mm -hmm. in Chile, in Colombia, in Mexico, uh, in Argentina. I was in my youth part of that, of one of those organizations. I can tell you in as much detail as you want. When they, I was 18 years old, 17 years old, I once got a phone call uh, in a very suspicious way, a voice that I thought I recognized. And, you know, one thing led to another. They asked me if I would be interested in, in, in joining a, a gathering of young people my age, all Jews, to talk about the future of the Jewish community. And... That led to another meeting, and eventually, for about a year, I was part mm -hmm. of this paramilitary group. We did. When you say paramilitary, do you mean there were weapons? Weapons. Yeah, there were Where weapons. There was get intelligence. Them? I, mean, I don't know. There's <laughs> starting in the sixties and seventies. The easiest <laughs> asked question is where to get weapons. <laughs> I mean, in the United States, I, there are millions oh, well, of weapons here, traveling you know, all over has. Latin America too. It, it, I don't know where they got yeah, the weapons. Yeah. I know that we all mm -hmm. had the access to them. That we had training. I eventually ended up in intelligence rather than in the actual. Sure. But I, I participated in different uh, operations. And as I look back at all that, Protection. I can tell you, Gloria, that it was a defining moment, crucial, in my journey as a Jew. And today, in the United States, when I see attacks against synagogues, synagogues. in Pittsburgh and in other places, I ask myself, what is the role that Jews, American Jews, should have in defending themselves. Do you let, leave it to the police? Do you leave it to the US Army? Do you do something on your own? Do you leave it to the State of Israel to do something? The questions are very controversial. I myself have become very controversial, sometimes in publishing um, comments on this. Comments, yeah. uh, but the one thing that I don't think we should do is not to think about it. Mm -hmm. I think regardless of whatever position you take or anybody in the audience mm -hmm. takes, at least it's something that our history pushes, you, pushes us to think about it. Mas Masada mm -hmm. is a rebellion against mm -hmm. the occupiers. Mm -hmm. uh, the there are various yeah. moments in the history of the Spanish Jews where the mm -hmm. Spanish Jews also consider mm -hmm. not, not being simply sheep taken to the mm -hmm. slaughter. And uh, that becomes much more... Of, a, of an attitude in the 19th century with the rise of nationalism, mm -hmm. socialism, the Bolsheviks, and then the Jewish state in 1948. Yeah. This is uh, is really very interesting. Something that it's, that calls one to question is why is it that in Latin America the subject of the Shoah is almost not touched. Yeah. It's an, another crucial question, Gloria, and the book is written uh, to ask those questions, not to answer them. Mm -hmm. I think our duty as writers, our duty as teachers, our, our duty as parents uh, is to ask the questions. To ask questions. Um, yeah. the sh it, even a, a figure like Anna Fra Anne, Frank, Anne Frank, whose diary is very popular in Latin America, is de-Judaized. She is seen yeah. as a victim <laughs> of the Nazis, but not a Jewish victim uh -huh. of the Nazis. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, in and of itself, mm -hmm. is a crucial, uh, very side. controversial mm -hmm. side sure. of things. 
Yeah, the Shoah, the, the Holocaust is, is distant, is disconnected. Mm -hmm. uh, in part, I would say the difference between how the Shoah has been assimilated mm -hmm. into American culture and not assimilated or integrated mm -hmm. into Latin American culture is that in the United States, the Jewish community feels fully part of the country. Yes. And mm -hmm. this is a topic that affects everybody. Uh, whereas in Latin America, the Jewish community is mm -hmm. not fully a member of everybody else. Mm -hmm. it, it remains ostracized, Separate. separated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that has resulted in the failure to articulate more openly mm -hmm. debates, uh, snippets of knowledge, mm -hmm. learning, pedagogical strategies mm -hmm. uh, that have to do with crucial moments in the 20th century yeah. that are defining already the 21st century yeah. Yeah. in substantial yeah. ways. Crucial moments in the history because in Latin America, the Inquisition sure. is not taught really Absolutely, in schools. Yeah. They don't touch it. You know? Absolutely, they don't touch it. In fact, uh -huh. in one of the chapters in the mm -hmm. book, I go to the Palace of the Inquisition in Mexico, mm -hmm. El Palacio de la Inquisición, Palacio de la Inquisición. which now is a museum, museum for medicine. It has nothing, it nothing still has the do. name of the Palace of the Inquisition, but it has yeah. no connection with the Inquisition yeah. directly. Come. You know, the fact that it is not part of textbooks in schools, that it is not discussed as an essential component in the history, mm -hmm. is a lapse in the identity, in the collective identity of, sure. of the entire sure. region. Sure. Because Latin America was a safe heaven for people running away from the Inquisition mm -hmm. in Europe, and they found a version mm -hmm. of the Inquisition mm -hmm. in Latin America, and it's as if it's the elephant in the room. If you don't talk about it, mm -hmm. you are not acknowledging the history of hatred mm -hmm. and intolerance that mm -hmm. has shaped mm -hmm. the whole region. And, the, and the, even the position of crypto Jews and of the uh, conversos, mm -hmm. well, why were they conversos? Why were they crypto Jews? Because of the force, the, the presence of the Inquisition. So I, I um, you know, it's a, it's a very fragile continent when it comes to mm -hmm. acknowledging its own history. Mm -hmm. And I think that only when democracy is fully ingrained can you acknowledge aspects that are very uncomfortable for many people to discuss. And if you don't acknowledge those aspects, you are doomed to repeat many yeah. of those mm -hmm. a a chapters. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the role of educators, it's the role of government officials, but uh, where there is corruption and where there is a lack of freedom, people want to survive rather than be thinking about the past. Yeah, yeah. to acknowledge history. Yeah. You know, you cannot erase history. Right. History is it's what it is. Right. And you have yeah, to you have face to, it yes, courageously yeah. and, and talk see about what it. it means. Yeah. You know. yeah. And even yeah. if it's controversial. Yeah. Sure. It's the history of slavery in Latin America, yeah. the mm -hmm. history of racism in mm -hmm. Latin America, uh, the history of uh, the obsessive, oppressive control of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. sexual abuse, domestic abuse. Those topics, we know. It's easy to put them in the closet Behind. and not talking about mm -hmm. But if you do that, they will continue. They will continue. Sure. Sure. You know, we're always a, a work in progress. Everybody, yes. every society. Yes. But there yes. are uh, more uh, humble ways, yes. direct ways to address yes. these yes. issues you're than right. others. Yeah, you're right. And you know, you know, you include in your writing some Kabbalistic elements. Yes which I find really fascinating. Uh, well, just to go on the title of the book, the book itself, yeah. you know, the seventh heaven, you know, when we arrive to the seventh heaven. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you for all these wonderful questions, mm -hmm. for, the, for the shrewd and direct and comprehensive reading of the book. You know, when one sits and writes a book, Gloria, one doesn't know what kind of reader one might have. Sometimes one never meets that reader. You, you, my father, who was an actor, um, 
I would tell him that I envied him because he was mostly a theater actor mm -hmm. and the theater actor has the audience in front of them mm -hmm. and they can see if they laugh or if they cry or mm -hmm. if they whatever reaction mm -hmm. that might have but the writer like the painter mm -hmm. writes or works in isolation mm -hmm. with his own ghosts mm -hmm. with his own ideas and then lets the work go out mm -hmm. in search of a set of eyes mm -hmm. and a mind And I particularly appreciate the last question of the many wonderful ones of, the, of Kabbalah and mysticism. For me, um, approaching knowledge is done in two ways. It's done through the mind, mm -hmm. but it's also done through the heart and through the body. Mm -hmm. And there are things that the mind does not register. Mm -hmm. uh, the mind does not see, no matter how sharp And, and, uh, and trained it is. And uh, there are many spiritual aspects of the Jews of Latin America that are very important that go beyond simple data and simple uh, facts. And that is the, those are currents that have to do with, with, a, with, with a more spiritual desire. Uh, and, you know, there are Kabbalists that have lived in Latin America, the whole indigenous culture, and the mystical aspects mm -hmm. of it have connected with many Jews that are mm -hmm. uh, endeared in practicing mm -hmm. uh, different rituals. And I, um, I, I take that aspect uh, as, uh, as importantly as many others in the region. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Yes, I really enjoyed traveling with you. Wonderful. Yes. I'm delighted. Yes. Delighted. Great. And thank you for this conversation. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> bless yes. You, bless you. Okay. <laughs> yes.